How many of you got just totally freaked out when I was like, we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit? And everybody's like, oh no. So anyway, but if you notice, I titled the name a little different so you would be aware that I was going to talk about. So, uh, But I'm glad you're here. It's going to be a great morning. Uh, I want to get started here pretty quick. I just want to welcome you and thank you for being here. Uh, I just want to ask that you would open your hearts and be prepared this morning for what it is that God has done. We've been in a cool series, if you don't know, over the last few weeks, actually for the last probably five months, uh, I'm talking about reprogram. We call it reprogram. So we're reprogramming the way that we think about the gospel. Um, if you've been in church very long, you were raised in church, probably fairly denominational, meaning that it was very, uh, there was a lot of religious undertones to it where it was a lot about your efforts. And so we've been reprogramming our thinking about that to have it in a, in a right perspective. And so uh, we didn't want it to be just that people take home that it's, oh, it's about thinking differently. You just got to think more positively. That's really what... Uh, because you can think positive all you want till you run out of energy for it and your willpower runs out and then you're going to be right back to what you believe. And so we're sliding into a kind of a sub-series called The Reprogrammer. So we've been talking about reprogramming and then we're really going to dive into uh, the, the person of the Holy Spirit because he is the one that's reprogramming us. And we're going to kind of get the idea of what that looks like and what that means. Uh, if you've not been from a charismatic church, you may not have hold the, heard about the Holy Spirit very much. You kind of maybe like, hey, he's part of the team, but we don't let him out of the box very much because he's kind of crazy, you know, that kind of guy. Uh, but I want to I want to dispel all that because um, that's really a, a really negative rap that a lot of charismatic church has kind of misrepresented that. And so I want to kind of clarify that and clear that up so that we understand how important he is to us because he is vital. He is God in the earth inside of us right now, moving. And so it's important that we understand who that is. And so uh, so let's just go and dive in. You guys ready to dive in? All right, let's close our eyes. Father, thank you once again for the opportunity to come into your presence and to hear the word of God. We ask that you would just guide us, teach us, because that's the best teaching is when you lead us to something. Not my words, not me rambling, but your words that hit the heart's of what you're already been speaking to them today in their own lives individually. And so I pray that you'll bring clarity of that today. And we love you and we always wanna learn. So we pray that you'll help us to grow today. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Come on, if you believe that, say amen. So question, have you ever had to help more than one person at one time? How many of you have more than one kid? All right, this are, that's an easy answer, right? So if you had to help more than one person at one time. So so some of you may not know that that that. So the other day, I'll just give you an example. The other day at the coffee trailer, man, it just some days, so we have, on Fridays, we have a company that calls and they'll be like, hey, we're gonna pick up, you know, we're gonna come by and get like nine coffees, okay? So, so they call us and then they, then they come by and we already kind of give time to prepare them. So one Friday, they just, they just, someone pulls up and they're like, hey, yeah, we're from, we're from the, you know, the company and, and here's our coffee order. So they got like nine coffees. Well, behind them is like four of the cars. Okay, so we're working on nine coffees, and then we got four. So we're like, hey, run out there and find out what the next car wants. We can work on theirs. Maybe we can get them going. They order four coffees, okay? And then, and then we got our phone ringing because someone's trying to call in something. You know, they're running behind. Those late people, you know what I'm talking about? Those late folks. Okay, I'll be running through. And so now, see, you guys thought we were just sitting back, sipping espresso and just like, what's up? You know, having that. Oh, no, Stress. Trying to help all these people at one time. And, and you know how, anybody know, can you, can you feel it yet, that pressure? Like I'm feeling the pressure. Mom's panicking. You know, everybody's panicking. And except for people that are just ordered the coffees. They're all, this is great, you know. And so I want you to get that tone because a, a lot of times, um, I, I actually thought about this whenever I thought about uh, Jesus was I thought, I wonder if you ever felt like that. I wonder if you ever felt like, oh my God, just stop. You know what I mean? I mean, it's okay, parents, that you felt like that towards your kids. I'll just let it's normal, right? Just stop talking and needing something right now. You know, just, okay. and so I, I thought about it. Go to Matthew 14. I, I want to kind of just dive in because I want to show you uh, something about the Lord and, and Jesus and how he works. And let's just read and you'll, you'll get the idea of what I'm saying. Verse 13, it says in verse 13, and when Jesus heard it, he departed from there by boat to a deserted place by himself. Now, what did he hurt? What did he just heard? He heard that John the Baptist had just been beheaded. So he got some terrible news that his family, a cousin of his, very close relationship was just beheaded. So I don't know if you've ever got bad news and then you had somebody needy, needing you, how that kind of feels, you know? And so he just heard this. He's been praying and ministering and healing people all the time. He just hears this. So they're about to depart to a deserted place 
Come on, just for just some rest, right? Everybody calm down for just a minute. But when the multitudes heard it, they followed him on foot from the cities. Let's pause there. If you go to Mark's account, it says that Jesus heard this. They got into a boat to go to a deserted place because the disciples had been ministering as well. And he's like, hey, let's go take a rest. And so they're getting ready to depart. The people, it says, knew where they were going. So they took off running to meet where he was gonna be. So you gotta imagine when you pull up, they're like, <laughs> here we are. And you just try to get away from them. Now, if I'm the Lord, I'm like, we weren't stopping here. Just turn on and keep on rolling. You know what I mean? But he pulls up and this is what, this is what his response was. Verse 14, and Jesus went out and saw a great multitude. He was moved with compassion for them and he healed their sick. He was moved with compassion. And I think that's interesting. One says that he recognized and he felt like they were sheep without a shepherd. And I thought, I wonder if he ever felt irritated by that. Like when he got out of the boat, he's like trying to work with people and he's like, listen guys, I said two lines. Getting two lines. You know, because if you ever try to deal with a crowd, if you don't have some order, it gets a little chaotic, right? So two lines, and he's getting irritated and they're just like, just send him home. But he didn't respond. He actually said it, that he had compassion for him. And he, and he began to minister to them. Listen, he'd been ministering to them all day, healing people. And he just heard the news that his, his, one of his closest relatives, one of his family members had just been beheaded. Someone that was very important in his life. Now, I don't know if I, see, we would be like, oh, he's good at compartmentalizing. See, we get real analytical by that. But can I tell you, it had nothing to do with his ability to compartmentalize things. I want to show you, and, and a lot of people will say, well, it was because he was God. That's why he could do this. And you may be thinking, well, what does that have to do with us? Well, think about the pressure. Can you imagine the demand on Jesus's life right now? I mean, can you imagine? Think about that. The demand that was on him where people were running to try to find him because they had needs. They're sick. They were hurting. They needed him. Can you imagine the demand? Well, you think about the demand on your life as being a super spouse or being a super parent or being a super employee. Your kids are like, I just want some grapes. You're like, you give them the grapes, but you really want to just throw them at them. And you're like, pastor, how do I not want to throw grapes at my children? And, and the thing about it is it's, it's this pressure. It's this, it's this overwhelming sense of what do I do? I, I, I don't have the capacity for this. Well, this is the reality of it is, is none of us do. None of this in the way that we operate in our normal thinking can operate into that capacity. Why? Because your willpower is designed to hold up in a decision until you either get frustrated or you fail at it and then you will say, I can't do this anymore, right? So what do we do or how do we do this? So Jesus, we're like, well, yeah, but he was God. Now I wanna show you something. Go to Philippians 2 because I wanna show you why he came to the earth. We, knew he, we, knew, we know that he came to, to deal with sin and to save us. That's, but I wanna show you how and why he came as a man. Okay, go to Philippians chapter number two. We're gonna read verse five down through verse eight. Because he tells us something in verse five. He said, let this mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. So he said, I want you to think the same way, okay? Who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery or something to be held on to, to be equal with God. So what it was saying was this. Even though he was in the form of God, he did not consider holding on to his God status. Okay, so he said, I'm, I'm not coming to earth as God. I'm coming to earth as a man. Okay, now watch what it says in the next verse. But he made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. So what is he trying to say? He said that, so he humbled himself to become like us. And he did that, so he stripped himself of his God status saying that, hey, I'm gonna go different than they are. He actually said, I'm gonna, I need to show up in the earth the exact same way that they are. The only difference was he was not born of the seed of man, so he did not have a sin nature. So whenever he was born into the earth, it said that he learned obedience. That means he learned how to follow God. Remember, we talked last week that he did no great miracles until he was baptized and the Holy Spirit descended like a dove, remember? And so he was filled with the power of God. So he was filled with the capacity or the grace of God to do what it was that he could do. So he began to heal. Why? So now he came to the earth and he did this to show us how a reborn man with the nature of God or the, the nature of a born again believer is how, to, how he can operate in the earth. 
So when you see him encounter multitudes of people and the pressures that come on that, uh, come on that situation, he was able to function where the pressure did not overwhelm him, but he was able to minister and have life. I don't know about you, but when I deal with people very much, I'm, I'm wore out. Yeah. <laughs> You're like, yeah. And the reason is, is because the energy we exert. Can I tell you this, that when we function from believing that God is the nature of our life, your energy is going to be greater than you can imagine. And it's like, well, how is that? Well, it's because we're taught in our mind and to believe that as you get older, you're going to wear out. You're going to get more tired. You're going to get, oh, you're getting, I'm about to get 50. And I'm like, I'm fired up for 50. I've looked 50 since I was like 25. with white hair and all this stuff. So, but I'm excited, why? Because, oh, you're about to get older. And I'm like, I, I refuse to believe, I know I get older, but I refuse to believe that I have to start declining. Come on, listen to this. Declining. Well, you're gonna, it says Moses, as he was in his 80s, 90s, his eyes did not, the, the strength or the force of his eyes did not diminish. It means he didn't get blinder as you go on. His strength was still massive or strong. 85, Caleb took a mountain. Joshua, same age, they, they defeated enemies at 85. So notice how we're talked into through our belief or what the world tells you is that you have to diminish when God says that you have abundant or everlasting life, meaning everlasting means that it's perpetual, means it never stops, it always continues on. When you were born again, a, eternal life started for you. It didn't start when you die, it started the moment that Christ became your Lord and he made you a new creation. You will never, in essence, die and be gone. You will fall asleep and you will enter in the next phase of your life, which is eternity. So cool. And so what it's showing us right here is he's showing us that, hey, listen, there's a thinking that was out of alignment with the way Jesus thought because Jesus was able to function. And watch what happened whenever he was able to surrender to this. Verse nine, this is amazing. Therefore, God highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. So because he yielded and he trusted in the father, God exalted him. We spend a majority, I spent a majority of my life trying to exalt myself. What, is, what does that mean? It doesn't mean like you're trying to make yourself, oh, I'm so cool. I am coolest. That's not what I mean. It means I'm trying to make myself more successful by working harder, by believing harder, by whatever it is. And what we've done is we have eliminated God from the equation to, he's kind of a, uh, What's it called when you just hire somebody uh, and they just kind of give you some advice? Yeah, like a, like a, like a consultant. That's what I'm like, oh my gosh. Yeah, a consultant. And it's like the, that God is our consultant in this life. He's not really, he's not really the source of it. Does that make sense? So he's kind of gets consulted in what's going on, but he's not the source or where we operate from. And I'll show you what that means here in just a minute. Okay, go to John chapter 16. Okay, so in follows uh, the Holy Spirit. Because you're like, okay, what does that mean for us? So we've been talking about how the Holy Spirit was given. Jesus said, I'm gonna leave and I'm gonna give you the comforter. This is John 16. Look at verse seven. I'll just read it up here. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage. Remember, we got an advantage that I go away for if I do not go away, the helper, the comforter, the paracletus, the one that comes alongside you will not come to you. But if I depart, I'll send him to you. So remember, Jesus was one man operating in earth at one place at one time. So watch, can you imagine the lines to, to, to meet Jesus if he was here today? So think about this. He interacted with one person at one time. That's all he could do. Why? Because he was just like us. So he said, it's to the advantage that I get out of here because when I'm out of the way, I'm gonna send somebody that functions just like me, but is different because he's not subjected to this body. So he's gonna come into the earth and he's gonna be the advantage. It says that he's going to send him to be help. Come on, look at your neighbor and say, we got some help coming. Have you ever had to wait for attention? Oh my gosh, don't get me started. You ever had to wait on attention? They would have had to wait in line for, to get Jesus to speak to them. Hours maybe, days to wait for him to show up. But think about this. 
um, it, it's interesting because, you know, it's like when you go to the doctor and you're sick and you're sitting out in the waiting room, the last thing you want to do is you want to wait on him to be late. I just threw that in there. <laughs> wait on him to be late, right? Why? Because you're miserable. Can you imagine being sick unto death and you're waiting on Jesus? You're like 800 in line. I'm gonna get there. But you knew once you got there, your life was gonna change. So the Holy Spirit, or Jesus says this, I'm gonna leave because it's, it's gonna be the advantage. And the advantage is this. It's not gonna just be just me in this earth. I'm gonna actually fill every new creation with the same life, the same power, the same authority that I have. Why? Because when you believe upon me, you become one with me and I now live in you and you live in me. That's what John 17 says. I and you and you and me and we're one. So now we're hidden in Christ, right? So now everything we do is because of what Jesus has done for us. So often we have spent our entire life trying to build faith for something, right? Faith for healing, faith for our kids to get better, faith for all these things. And the reality is our faith has been directed in the wrong direction. Our faith needs to be simply focused upon the work that Jesus did at the cross, his death, burial, and resurrection. Because what that accomplished was everything that we would ever need. Because once he accomplished that and I received him as my savior, remember Colossians, we've talked about this for months, that you and I became complete in him. Lacking nothing. And now, see, once again, this is the hard part. This is where our mind's like, well, think about it. I lack a lot of stuff. Well, naturally, your natural mind says you do, but Jesus says the exact opposite of what we think. So who do you think's right? Well, I am, obviously. But notice, he says that you are complete in him. You've probably spent a majority of your church life people telling you that you're not complete, that you're trying to be complete. And the reality of it is, that's why it's such an uphill struggle, is because you're trying to become something that you can never become. Because Jesus said, you are that because I made you that way. You can't become it, only I can make you. And he made us right whenever we received him as our savior. Come on, lift your neighbor and say, I'm complete. Oh my God, can you imagine? Your spouse is like, yeah, I know that one. I know that story. Listen, why is that the case? Because you've been taught to believe that you're not. So why do you think we've had the, the Holy Spirit in the church for 2,000 years and we're less powerful than we were 2,000 years ago? When you have the life, it calls it the resurrection life. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives inside of us. And he is saying, what, what's, what's, what's the rub at? And the rub is, is because we're in the way of trying to achieve something that, allow, that does not allow the spirit of God to achieve through us. We're trying to make it happen. We're trying to be good enough. We're trying to live righteous enough so that he'll do something. And what it does is it gets in the way of him moving through you and transforming us, right? We're constantly trying to change. Change is the idea that you're not something that you're trying to become transformation is you are something that you're just trying to let become in you or let be who you already are. See, some of you had talents, maybe sports talents. You didn't have to get those from somewhere. He gave those to you. They were already in there. You couldn't catch a ball worth a lick, but they were already in there. All you had to do was let those skills come out of you as you begin to operate in them, right? You didn't have to say, Lord, Lord, please let me learn how to catch this ball. You had to do it through the process of applying your faith that when they threw that ball, I was gonna be able to catch it. And you did it enough where it became part of your nature. The first time you tried to catch a ball, you probably got hit in the nose. You're like, I'm never doing this again. Once the pain passed, you got back out there, you tried it again. And the more that you got closer and closer to catching it, you finally caught it and you begin to develop in that. Same thing with our faith. We've had some success because it's, it's worked a little bit, but then we got challenged or we got hit hard and we kind of backed down. And so we would just quit and say, well, maybe that's not what God has. No, that's exactly what God wanted for you. But what happened was just because we have a failure or we didn't get success in that area, doesn't mean it was, a, it was over. It just meant that you're learning. You're learning how to trust God. 
And this is what's cool about God is he is so for you, it's not even crazy. Now watch this, here we go. This is Luke chapter eight. This is a crazy story. Another one, this is, shows you the pressure that Jesus was on, watch this. So it was when Jesus returned that the multitude welcomed him for there were, they were all waiting for him. So this is after he'd already crossed, he was crossing back over and there was waiting for him a bunch of people once again. And behold, there came a man named Jairus and he was a ruler of a synagogue. He fell down at Jesus' feet, begged him to come to his house. For he had only a daughter about 12 years of age and she was dying. But as he went, the multitudes thronged him. I don't, I've never been thronged. I don't even really know what it meant, so I had to look it up. So it says, Jesus is like, hey, this guy's begging. His daughter's about to die, so let's go, I wanna go heal her. So he starts walking. It says, they begin to throng him. That word throng means to suffocate. That means that people were so pressuring him that he began, it was like, oh my gosh. Like you think about your kids and they kind of crawling all over you and you're kind of over it. And you're like, I can't breathe. You really can breathe, but you feel like you can't breathe, right? Why? Because they are, they are, they are pressuring you from all sides with their needs. Okay, I need you to hear this. They're pressuring you with their needs. This is what's interesting about us. When we have to wait, when we don't get attention, when we don't get God to respond to us immediately, we begin to go try to find something to solve that pressure. Let me get to what I mean. So when my dad was going through one of his surgeries, he had open heart surgery and, and you know, I don't know if you guys have ever seen anybody, but they have to, uh, what is it? They stick a tube down your throat to breathe. So when he, came, when he woke up, they left the tube down his throat to breathe for a while. And I don't know if you've ever done that, but I've got a straw in my throat before and I felt like I was dying. So this is down your throat all the time. And so it's easy to feel like you're choking. So I walk into this room and I see him in this condition. You know, if you've ever seen your parent in a condition, it's like, what is going on? You got monitors hooked up, all these different things. It's like, holy moly. And I'm just there trying to talk to him and he starts choking. I start panicking, right? I'm feeling the pressure because he's choking. I don't know what to do. I want to yank it out of his throat, you know, but that's probably not wise. So I go looking for something to solve the problem. I run in and there's a nurse there and I'm like, hey, my dad's choking. And she's kind of like, okay. I'm like, I'm like, hey, here we go. Hey, he's choking. She's like, okay. I'm like, you need to get some urgency about you because he's choking. And she's like, okay. I'm like, you're not getting this. So I go back to the room and she comes back in there and she's like, oh, hey, Mr. Day. And she's real calm. And I'm thinking, you need to be like me. You need to be as terrified as I am, as crazy acting as I am, but fix it. And she was not any of the things. So what had happened was the moment that I didn't get attention, guess what I started doing? I started putting pressure on the situation. Okay, watch this. You're gonna learn something really amazing by this. We are so good at doing this. The moment that you don't get the attention you need, whether it's in your marriage, in your home, your job, your finances, you will start to put pressure on somebody to fix that problem for you. Come on, your neighbor says, so good. Did you get that? Write that down, spouse. When you're not getting the attention that you need. So remember, remember this, we've been learning this, that our attention is not supposed to be pushed out this way. It's supposed to be pushed up this way. Because when I push it this way, his grace is, comes upon me. His grace comes from the inside of me, works out of the spirit of God. And what happens is that allows me to function the way that we see Jesus was. That pressure can be coming from here, but it's not influencing how I operate. Why was she not nervous? Because she, she's in that pressure. She knows when people are choking that he's not choking to death. It's probably just hitting his gag reflex. I didn't know that. It's because I was ignorant, Right? That just means I didn't know. But she knew that. See, so when I know something, I don't panic because I know that it's covered or it's going to be okay. When I don't know if God's going to do it, then I panic. And then I start to put pressure on to get that solved so I can feel comfort. Right? And we all do this. Why? Because that's what we do. We have to put pressure. I'm going to tell you this really quick. God, the, our walk with God, our relationship with God is supposed to be effortless. And just let you let that sit. Just let that marinate for just a second, okay? It's supposed to be effortless. Go to John chapter 16. Glad I got your attention. John 16, look at verse 22, and we're gonna read through verse 24. This is, this is really good. I want you to grab hold of this. Therefore, you, you, now you have sorrow, 
but I will see you again and your heart will rejoice and your joy no one will take from you. So Jesus was telling them they were, they were about to have the, the Last Supper. Uh, John 15, 16, 17, they're all in this, in this phase of conversation. And he says, we're, we're, I'm getting ready to leave the earth. You've been telling them this for, for probably a year. Hey, I'm gonna leave, I'm gonna die, and I'm gonna come back. And they're like, we don't understand what that means. So he says, I'm telling you I'm going and you're already starting to get sorrowful because you don't really understand what I'm saying to you. He says this, and in that day, you will ask me nothing. Okay, this is amazing. So their encounter with Jesus was like this. Hey, Jesus, we need some food. And Jesus is like, okay, this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna go catch a fish. Inside his mouth is gonna be some money. And we're gonna take it and go pay taxes. What? So they would ask Jesus and he would answer their question, okay? So he says, in this day, when I go, you're gonna ask me nothing. You're not gonna ask me anymore. Most assuredly, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he'll give it to you. Until now, you've asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. Okay, so he's, he's, he said, I'm gonna change your operating system because this is how this is a different operating system. So you used to just ask me. He said, but what I want you to do is now you're not gonna ask me nothing. You're gonna ask in my name. From, this, from before, you never asked the Father in my name. You just asked me. So now I want you to ask the Father in my name and I want you to know that he's gonna give you what you ask. Now I want you to pause because this is a lot for me. I don't know about you, but this is a lot for me. Mark eleven twenty four. 24, I want you to read this in combination. Watch this. Same general, therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you'll have them. Okay, let's just pause. Let's just kind of dissect this because I, I, I was praying about this the other day, I was not praying specifically about this. I was just kind of praying, just talking to God as I was walking around. And this is what I felt the Lord impressed on my heart, okay? And when I say the Lord told me this, this is what I feel like he's telling me. Remember, I always tell you guys that if I say I, I feel like the Lord's telling me this, I'm about 60% sure. And that's on like a really confident day. So I felt like the Lord was telling me this. And this is what I felt like he said to me. I'll give you whatever you ask. Now stop. And the reason I had to stop is because this, I thought, I'm not sure I believe that. Now think about it. I'll give you whatever you ask. So I had to stop and start to really think about and meditate on what he was actually trying to tell me. Because notice what we'll do the moment he tells us something, we'll start to qualify it through our filter of what we think he meant. Well, he meant, if you're doing things right, and you're living right, and you ain't cussing anybody out this week, you ain't been doing anything wrong, then he'll give you what you ask. If you trust him long enough and you can handle it. But he didn't say that. He just simply said this. If you ask me, if you ask the Father in my name, I'll give it to you. What does that mean? Jesus said, I'm now gonna tell you how this works. He's given me all authority. I mean, I have the authority over everything. And he, and he said, and what I want you to do is I want you to ask the Father in my authority as if you're me, and he'll give you what you ask. I told you guys, my grandparents owned a restaurant when I was growing up like a little Dairy Queen, and all the grandkids got to eat for free. You've heard the story, I'm sorry, but I just, wanted, I just need you to see the picture, okay? And so I would walk up there as a little kid, and I'd walk up, I'd knock on the drive-thru window, and I'd say, yeah, I want a side of bacon, extra crispy. That's all, I guess that's all I liked, extra crispy. And they would just give the bacon, cook it, and just give it to me. I'd walk off, right? Why? Because my grandfather said, you get to eat for free here. Right. Everything I have, you get, right. okay? But there would be times whenever I would show up, somebody knew, I'd say, I need extra crispy bacon. And they would come back up here and they would be like 60 cents. Blight. <laughs> my grandpa said, I get it for free. Uh, who are you? Well, I'm Josh. <laughs> yeah. We go to the whole conversation. Finally, someone would come over who knew and would say, oh yeah, they get it for free. Now, what am I trying to show you? It's because sometimes when people don't know what God is saying or what he has said, they'll try to qualify it differently. And they'll say, know what? You don't get this for free. You have to achieve it. Right. By achieving, that means you have to pay for it. Right. Jesus already paid That's for right. everything that you and I could ever need. Right. What that means is this, all your sins, past, present, and your future, he's already paid for those. And that's hard for us because we're like, yeah, but that's not fair if we still do something when we shouldn't do it. It's not fair, but he did it. Like to me, I would be like, that's not right. 
but I'm so thankful he did that because I still mess up. But he still says, you know what, Josh, I'm not qualifying you based on that. I'm qualifying you based on the fact that you believe in what I sent Jesus to do. And if I sent him to do that, do you believe that he paid for that sin once and for all? So what does that mean? That means now I've been put in a position to be able to ask him for anything and he said he would give it to me. Now, what does that mean? How many knows that if your kid, that kids are like, okay, that's a great deal. I'm gonna ask my parents if I can drive. I'm 12, but I'll ask them if I can drive. And they should say yes, because I should ask my father anything and they'll give it to me. This is how God works. God will give you, it says in this, every promise in the Bible are yes and amen. Meaning this, there's no, there's no doctrine that says that his answers are no to you when it concerns his promise. It says they're all yes and amen. Meaning this, when you ask him for a promise, he'll say yes to it. But here's the caveat. He will prepare you for what you're asking for. Meaning this, Lord, I need a lot of money in my life, okay? If he gives you a lot of money and your thinking's wrong, then you'll do exactly with that money what would destroy you. So he's gonna prepare you for that. That's right. You see what I'm saying? So every answer to him is yes. That's why it doesn't just fall in your lap the moment he says that. Why? Because he loves you enough to prepare you just like you're not gonna give your kids the keys and be like, yeah, just take off the town. You're fine. I, I trust you, right? Like, I'm gonna teach you how to drive this car. I'm gonna teach you how to trust me. It's kind of how God works, okay? Let's dig in, we're almost there. So how is this? Go to Acts chapter one, verse eight, okay? I'm gonna, I'm gonna hustle through this. But you shall receive power. So it wasn't just, hey, this is a cool thing that happened. He said, I'm gonna give you power. You're gonna receive it. It means you didn't earn it, you're receiving it. It means it's a gift that you accept. Power when it, the Holy Spirit has come upon you. That word power is the word dunamis. It means where we get our word dynamite. Okay, so whenever that word gets put into something, it has an explosive power to it. I might know that dynamite changes the shape of something. It blows things up. Have you guys ever had to cut weeds with little hand clippers when you were growing up? Where you squeeze them, it's like scissors. See, my grandmother had those. We had to go out there and clip them. But how many of you bought a weed eater? Which is a great name for that tool. It eats weeds. This one is all about your efforts and guess how, how long it operates till you're exhausted. That weed eater, you can full tilt the whole time and you can chew up weeds faster than anything. Why? Because there's a power behind it that is not executed in you. So our walk with God, the power's not executed on your power, it's executed in his power that he put inside of you when the spirit of God came to live within you. So this is crazy that your body right now houses the resurrection life of God, meaning this, it takes things that are dead and resurrects them right. into life, okay? You're like, whoa, you're about to get weird. No, I'm not gonna get weird, I promise, okay? So it blows up death, it blows up lack, it blows up sickness, okay? It changes the shape, okay? Here's another verse, go to Philippians chapter two. Here we go. Taking you somewhere, so just hang with me, okay? Philippians two. <laughs> And look at verse 13 when you get there. Verse 13 says this, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. So he put his power in you and now he said he's working in you for you to have the will and the ability to do it. Okay, so this is interesting because a lot of times we're like, okay, well, what does that mean? Because we think that once we're born again, then he puts it in our hands and is like, okay, fix it, get better, do something right. How many knows that we just keep messing it up? I don't know about you, I may be the only guy, but I always mess this thing up. I don't think right half the time, I get mad. And it's like, why am I doing this? Why? Because I am trying to do it within my own strength. I put too much pressure on you to make me happy. You're supposed to say amen right there, All right? Amen, yeah, you do, back off. And because I put pressure on you, I am held hostage until you do what's right to make me happy. So you didn't know that you put yourself in a hostage situation just because you put pressure on somebody else to meet that need. When they're not designed for, remember, he's the only one designed to meet that need. And when we're complete in him and he's the one that fulfills us, this gets easier. Now, I'm gonna show you something very cool about your, about your walk, okay? So he says, he's gonna work in you to will and to do for his good pleasure. Okay, when you were born again, you transformed, right, into a new creation. How many believe that when you were born again, you became a new creation, right? Just like the Bible said. Isn't that good? So cool, right? Now, the Bible says this. This is in, in, in 1 John 3. It says that you've passed from death 
to life. Now, this is amazing. Did you know that when you passed from death to life, you did that effortlessly? How many of you, when you got saved, you were like, I'm going, did anybody do that? No. (laughs) Somebody's like, yeah, you're a little wild. (laughs) Why? Because you had nothing to do with that transformation. When you accepted Jesus' death, his burial, and his resurrection, it said that same spirit that lived in him now lived in you and made you or It bore you again, for lack of better words. And you became brand new. Think about that. You passed from death to life. And you did it without effort. But then we go to church and it's like, here's a bunch of effort we got to do. And we start on a journey to try to make him happy. And I'm going to tell you right now, we are failing miserably. Why? Because there's no way he will ever be happy. Why? Because he's already happy. You're like, he's happy? Oh, yeah. It said his wrath was satisfied through Jesus. So he wasn't upset about anything because Jesus satisfied it all. So if he's satisfied, then who are we trying to please? Who can I tell you? Everybody else. Everybody else has got their standard that the way I should live and how I should look and how I should act. And so when I live according to that, I feel miserably. Why? Because I'll never meet that standard because it's not me. It's who he made me to be. And so he said, I passed it, that. I did that effortlessly. Now think about it, go to Ephesians chapter three, all right? So here's the fruit of it. So when you pass death to life, go to First John chapter three while they're going to Ephesians three. We know that we have passed from death to life because, or the fruit of passing from death to life is you now have love for the brethren. So can I tell you this? And this is gonna be hard, but I need you to really just like let it sit and meditate on it. Just because I pray and repeat a prayer after somebody does not mean I pass from death to life. I need you to hear that. He said, you'll know you have whenever love is the fruit or the desire of your heart. Right. Listen, it doesn't mean you're going to be perfect. It just means now you have a love for people. Right. You have a love. He said, that's how you know that something's changed in your heart is when you now feel love for other people. See, we've qualified it as like, hey, it's just this thing you do and it, and, and it doesn't really feel like anything. He said, you'll know it because you now have love for others. That's the test of knowing if your heart has been transformed. And it is so amazing by this is because that's where power has caused something to take place in us. You can't explain it. And it doesn't mean you're like walking around going, I just love everybody. That's not what that means. It means you now have a favor towards life than a favor towards trying to destroy everything or trying to destroy situations or destroy yourself, okay? Now, here's the last verse. Ephesians chapter three, okay, here we go. Now, in your new creation, that dunamis destroyed the old man. It's dead, right? It was buried with Christ in baptism and now you've been raised to new life. It says you were raised and you were justified, meaning you were made right with God. Raised from the dead, justified. You were right with God, okay? Just let that sink. Now, Ephesians chapter three, now watch how this works. This is in the Amplified. It says, now to him who by or in consequence of the action of his power. So he said, here's the consequence of what he did, okay? How many of there's consequences when you do something wrong? You know, because you did that, you're gonna sit over here in the corner. So he says, here's the consequence of what Jesus did. He said, that power that is at work within us, The consequence of what he did releases a power that is at work within us that is able to carry out his purpose and do super abundantly. It's like a cool word. Super abundantly, far over and above all that we dare ask, think, infinitely beyond our highest prayers, desires, thoughts, hopes, or dreams. Say, so think, just let this. He said it's a consequence of what Jesus did, that his power is released in you. And he said that power within you is exceeds above what you can even dream about. I want you to think, I got some pretty good, I could ask for some pretty crazy stuff. I don't know about you, but I could ask for it. The problem is, is the moment that we were like, that's so cool, I'm gonna ask God for something. Hey, God, I asked that you would do this. And then it's like, your mind says, he probably won't do that. 
right? Why? Because your mind has not been renewed to the fact that he can do anything. So our mind says, nope, get up, get behind that fence of your abilities. And the Holy Spirit's like, no, just let me loose. And I can take your thinking and stretch it. That's why he says we got to renew our minds. Why? Because we have to change, train, change the way we think by renewing, meditating on the word of God, meditating on what he has said, because then it begins to help us think differently. Right? You ever had somebody that had no confidence in their life? They don't want to do anything? And the moment, let's think about it from a kid walking. Like, you guys remember when your kids started learning to walk? And they would, you'd stand them, they'd learn to stand up for a minute and they'd just like collapse. Then you'd stand them up again and then they would take that first step. And this is what we would all do. They're walking. They're not really walking. They're kind of falling forward. Really? Right? You know what I mean? You know what I mean? Really? They're just kind of falling forward. Because walking is, is this. I'm in control. Right? I'm not falling. They're not in control. They're just like, oh. And so what they're, but they're learning, but here's this, they're falling forward. I want you to listen to those words. They're falling forward. See, in, in our walk with God, we're, we're stepping into something bigger than our capacity. A lot of times we're falling forward in it. That you're stepping out to try to believe God for something. It goes, circumstantially goes totally opposite of what you're thinking. And we're like, okay, this ain't working. No, no, no. You're just falling forward. It feels like it's not working, but let's just stop and regroup and realize that God can do anything through what Jesus did on the cross. And now I just have to believe that because believing that gives me access to every inheritance and promise in this book. So take your faith off of things and justify it based upon what he did on the cross. Well, my kids are acting crazy. Well, let me tell you what's amazing about God is he's the best parent on the planet. And when you don't have control and you can't, don't know what to do, guess what? He's amazing because he talks to them and he gets into their heart and speaks to them and they don't even know what's going on. They're making decisions. They don't even realize why they're making decisions, but he's influencing that heart in ways that I could tell them all day long and they're like, yes. but how many knows when it's your idea, you're more apt to do it and believe it. Right. And that's how he works in us to will and to do for his good pleasure. All right. I want you to do this for me. I want you to stand to your feet. And it says this, because his power is working with